a bird's eye view of the design, uh, and then we'll walk over each of these pieces of the design. Um, then I'll look at the current status, and then uh, whatever the, the future work is. So um, first, I, I was already quickly introduced, um, but I'll just quickly uh, introduce myself a bit more. So I'm doing a master's at the, of computational science at the University of Amsterdam, and I'm almost done with it. Just need to finish my thesis. Um, I usually do software, not so much hardware, but I got more interested in uh, hardware and sp specifically being around uh, hackerspaces here uh, really helps with well, people <laughs> who uh, know a lot more about it and they can help you. Um, and I work at uh, White Box Systems in Amsterdam, which is uh, how uh, we start thinking about uh, Trusted Boot on the OLMX Lime, and I do some work for the Internet Archive uh, part-time. And uh, if I make any mistakes, uh, most of my info is from the internet, and they're probably right, and I might have misinterpreted it, so uh, it's probably my mistake. Um, OK. So uh, let me quickly introduce the white box system, because that's what's uh, spawned uh, uh, this project. Um, it's an authorization and communication system for uh, healthcare in the Netherlands, and uh, it's specifically uh, decentralized. And um, the reason we started with this is because most of the uh, groups in the Netherlands working on healthcare, with healthcare, including uh, some parts in the government, they really just are pushing for a centralized system. So uh, everything in one data center um, and access control is you either get access or you don't, so it's not very, very fine-grained. And they are working on making it a bit more fine-grained, but still we don't believe that uh, all the personal medical information should be stored in one data center somewhere. Um, because, of course, if, there, if you're a sysadmin there, you can probably get access, and there's too many ways it can go wrong. And uh, we believe that this kind of information is very privacy sensitive. Um, there's probably good reasons to not let certain uh, insurance companies get access to it as well. Um, so that's why we're going for a decentralized model, and uh, well, there are not many other parties doing it, <laughs> because it's uh, usually more compli complicated as well. So some things that we really have to tackle. Um, is a reproducible build. So um, all our, not all our code is open source, but it's published source. So any other third party can take our code, build it, and verify that they get the same binary as we do. And uh, projects like Debian have been working a lot on reproducible builds. And we've, of course, been using some of their work. Um, so the idea is that in the future, uh, there are other third parties, trusted third parties, that will also take our code, build it, and verify that they get the same uh, binaries, and then sign those. And then if you have multiple parties signing the code, you're probably, uh, you can be reasonably sure that we at least have not been able to put in a, a private backdoor that's uh, not clearly visible in the public source code. And you can hope that uh, there's no backdoor in the source code inserted by the compiler. But if it is, then everyone has the same backdoor. So at least you know that. Um, <coughs> and of course, uh, if such a system does get compromised, it should be fixed uh, as quickly as possible. So. Um, in our, in, our, in our view, every uh, general practitioner, the, basically the doctor where you go to if you get sick or whatever, something wrong, you just go to him or her first. Uh, they have a white box in their, in their, well, in their practice, so, and which is connected to their system. So the white box arranges access control. Uh, it doesn't actually contain medical data itself. It just authorizes systems to fetch certain uh, information. And of course, if someone compromises such a system, you really want to fix the compromise as soon as, as, soon as possible. And um, of course, if, if something goes wrong, it's still a decentralized system. So in that sense, uh, only, only a small part will be compromised. But of course, it's not unthinkable that, there's, uh, uh, that someone could uh, attack many systems at the same time. And then you really don't want a <laughs> compromise to be permanent, because of course, it means that some information can be uh, uh, leaked. Uh, but also that you have to go everywhere and uh, <laughs> reinitialize all the machines, which is, of course, not what you want. Um, OK. Yeah, so the central aspect uh, is that uh, the general practitioner should be in control. So the, he or she owns the white box, uh, has full access to it. We don't have access beyond uh, basic uh, statistics about <laughs> uh, certificates that are, are being used, for example. So we, this is the idea of how do we prevent permanent uh, uh, remote compromise? Um, yeah. Um, OK, and the hardware that we use for our white box is uh, made, in, uh, made by Olimax. Um, and it's called the Olinux Lime, Lime 2. <laughs> I still have trouble uh, pronouncing it at times. But uh, as you might or might not know, Olimax is a company from Bulgaria. And I think they're from, from Plovdiv. Uh, and they make really nice boards. Um, they're a dual core uh, CPUs at 1 gigahertz, which is more than enough for our purpose. 
Uh, they have one gigabyte of RAM. They have SATA, so you can attach an SSD or an HDD. Um, they have gigabit Ethernet, I think the recent versions. Uh, several USB 2 ports, and they support other uh, storage as well, such as NAND flash, uh, SPI NOR flash, micro SD, and eMMC. And I'll explain some of the terms if you don't know them yet uh, later on. And what's also very nice is that they're open hardware, so you can get their schematics. Um, the, the layout of the PCB and everything, you can figure it out. Uh, the, of course, what they can't help is that some parts are still closed. Uh, the ARM Cortex CPUs that they are using are, are closed. The all-winner system on chip is closed, but that's, uh, at this point, still very hard to, to fix, so to say. Uh, there are some uh, universities or, or groups working on uh, open, open uh, processors as well. I think it's Risk v is one of them. Um, so we'll, we'll switch to that maybe at some point, and hopefully Olimux will produce boards for them as well, but uh, at this point we're stuck, we're stuck with this. Um, so it's mostly open hardware. <laughs> um, okay, so the actual thing, trusted boots. What we really want is we always want to boot to a trusted state initially, um, which means you take the power out, even if someone uh, had root access, they could either damage the system to the point it doesn't boot anymore, or you get to a trusted state. So there's no way that you can boot to an untrusted state where immediately when you press the power, there's some uh, remote compromise and someone can log into the machine. Um, of course, OS uh, upgrades should be possible. So if the operating system goes out of date or we release new software or we want to patch our uh, C library, uh, this should be possible. Um, and we are uh, introducing some extra hardware to achieve the trusted boot, and I'll, I'll tell more about that later. It's basically a simple microcontroller unit. Um, and we want it to be very open and, and cheap. So of course, all the code that we're writing will be open source, either GPL or BSD. Um, and we're trying to use very cheap components, so it, it shouldn't be very hard to, to produce this in mass or just buy it for your own Wi-Fi router at home. And we want users to be in control. So there, there are many people uh, doing some kind of trusted boot, secure boot, or, or restricted boot, as the Free Software Foundation calls it. And um, they usually are made to lock you out of your laptop. So some Microsoft service laptop locked you out of running Linux. Um, and the same happened with some Lenovo machines. And that's not what we want. We just made this for, for people to buy and, and, and use for themselves. And we want whoever owns the hardware to be in control, not whoever produced it. Um, so that, that's very important. And uh, there's varying degrees of complexity in, in which you can use the system because not, not every use case is the same. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, OK, so a bit of terminology. Um, I'm throwing some terms at you right now, and I'll <laughs> mention a lot more later on. So I, I'm just quickly mentioning a few of them. So if I say TBM, I mean the Trusted Boot Manager module, which is the extra hardware that we're introducing. Um, if I say RO boot image, it means it's a read-only uh, boot image, so it's uh, whatever is stored. Uh, it, it's like your BIOS, but, but slightly different. Uh, so it's, it's read-only and stored on the flash. If I say flash, there's many types of flash, but I specifically mean SPI nor flash, unless I mention otherwise. Um, and SPI is a serial, serial peripheral interface, so it's a way to interface uh, with a flash chip. And nor is just a way of well, how the flash chip works. There's nor, nor uh, flash and NAND flash. Uh, there's lo usually with NAND flash, you have a lot more capacity, but it's very unstable, so you need to uh, uh, to deal with the, how unstable it is. And with NORFLASH, it's usually very stable, but the capacity is very large. So it varies usually from 1 megabit to 128 megabit, uh, 16 megabytes. Um, and then specifically, there are two main stages, which is the, the first is the trusted stage, where uh, only trusted code is executed. So uh, we know for sure that there's <laughs> uh, we can trust the code that's running on, on the system at this point. And uh, untrusted code, which doesn't necessarily mean the system is compromised, it's just that we, don't, uh, that we can't trust it from a boot manager perspective anymore, which is almost immediately after booting. Uh, but it does mean that uh, usually that code is initially verified, so it's not we're booting some random code, which we don't trust, but it's just that from the boot manager perspective, we don't trust it. Now, I'll talk about this a lot more because it's a bit confusing, but I couldn't think of uh, better terms. Um, Two things that I'll at least be mentioning, and I probably forgot some. Um, and, and if you really have a question, just raise your hand, and I think uh, he will come to you with a microphone, and we can take a small break, because it's, uh, it's nice. If you don't get it, I can just quick, probably quickly uh, explain it. Uh, and it's probably a mistake on my side if it's not clear, so uh, please do. OK, so there's Das U-Boot, or U-Boot, I guess, uh, if you don't pronounce it the German way, which is a universal bootloader. And the joke is, I guess, that U-Boot is a submarine in German. Um, and there's the inner drama FS, which is, if you don't know it, I guess if you're not uh, doing a lot with Linux, you're probably not familiar with it. It's the also well known as initial RAM file system or initial RAM disk. 
And it's basically a small piece of code that you can embed in your kernel, in your Linux kernel, uh, which is loaded right after starting up. So the Linux kernel starts and then immediately uh, unpacks this kind of code. Um, so that you at least have some sort of file system where you can do basic things like unlock my crypto device or, uh, or do whatever else you want. Scan for more disks. OK, so uh, a simplified view of the trusted boot, finally. Um, there's some read-only code on the line, which you just can't modify unless you're physically there, um, which is not in our, our threat model. Um, and it's always executed first. So we know that if the line starts, it searches for some code to run, and it will always run our code. Thus, we know our code uh, uh, is running on the line. And at that point, the line can fully interface with the trusted boot manager. They communicate over serial, and, uh, well, it can just... Uh, ask whatever it wants from the trusted boot manager within the protocol and uh, uh, we'll work with that. Um, it will cryptographically check validity of the images. So the trusted boot manager does not verify the images. The Lime 2 does that. Because it runs trusted code, we can do it there and the Lime is much faster and more powerful. We can reuse existing code rather than write our own. Um, and of course, the Lime 2 uses information from the trusted boot manager to uh, check the validity, but it doesn't do any crypto there. It will say, for example, uh, hey, have you, do you know this image? Have I booted it uh, before, or is it new? Uh, this kind of stuff, because the Lime has only read-only code, so it can't store any extra information somewhere. That's why we need this trusted boot manager. Um, then it will boot images. Um, so an image is just like a new kernel plus a root file system plus uh, some other tools. And uh, it will do that with either KX or KXEC or another way, and I'll explain what it is a bit later on. Um, and then it will tell the trusted boot manager that it's now entering untrusted mode. <laughs> uh, you can imagine that the last two points might be swapped. It first says, I'm now going to boot untrusted code, and then it will do that. Um, yeah. OK, so the hardware setup is relatively straightforward, and the, the components are quite cheap. So the Lime 2 boots from Flash, and in this case it boots from SPI nor Flash. And the Flash is a write protect uh, pin on the Flash, so that means that um, if you set it up right, you can't write anything to the Flash. You can still read from it and do all the communication, but you can't uh, write to it. Uh, it's a bit more complex than just not connecting the pin, <laughs> but uh, um, well, I'll get to that later. And the Trusted Boot Manager is a simple uh, microcontroller unit. Um, it will be some ARM M0 uh, CPU running at 48 megahertz without any uh, memory management unit. So it's a really simple thing, just a bit more powerful than, say, an Arduino. Um, and the trusted boot manager and the Lime, they will communicate over serial. The Lime has like nine serial interfaces, and the, trust, and, uh, the trusted boot manager has several as well. So they'll just talk over serial and uh, speak in some text or binary protocol. Um, so they don't share anything other than the serial, so there's no way for the Lime to for the Lime 2 to access other information from the TBM, for example. And the TBM is required for, as I said, some use cases to prefer, uh, prevent certain attacks, with, uh, which I'll discuss later. Um, do note that this is not limited to all A20 or LMX devices. Uh, we did have to do some hardware modifications, but they're relatively straightforward. And if you have an uh, open WRT router running, MIP, uh, running in on, on MIPS, or you have an ARM, ARM, other ARM development board or some Intor PowerPC, as long as they can boot from SPI nor Flash, you can probably do this uh, right. I mean, there's some ifs, but uh, you it can be used on many more more systems. So for example, uh, we can use some old ThinkPad with LibreBoot on there and see if we can do the same thing there, or with a, a Wi-Fi router running OpenWRT. OK, so I, I, I've already kind of talked about the features, uh, but we really just want to prevent permanent compromise. And to do that properly, you really have to think about uh, about trust, right? We can put a single key on there and say, OK, we signed it. and. Uh, if we issue a new update, then uh, we'll use our key and sign it, and that's it. Um, but that doesn't scale, because if we lose the key or uh, someone steals our key, then all our systems are compromised, and we have a big problem. Um, so, so this is a big, a big thing in the Trusted Boot Manager. Trust and key management is uh, something that also depends on your use case. So uh, for, for a Wi-Fi router, I don't need uh, a lot of <laughs> different keys from various third-party vendors. I just want my own Wi-Fi router to run whatever I signed. Um, and then if I take out the power plug it back in, it should go back to a trusted state. And we don't want to be a TPM. A TPM is a trusted platform module, which you can find in many uh, uh, recent hardware, laptops and, 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 and desktops. And the TPM does much more than what we uh, need. It does uh, crypto, even though it's still <laughs> quite slow. It does a lot of crypto. It uh, has a random number generator, so you can use it for key generation or, or other randomness. 
And that's complex, and we don't want complexity. We want it to be very simple, because then you can understand what it does, and it's a lot of work for us to write and to verify that it uh, does what, 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 want, what we want it to do. Um, and that will probably also uh, make it less likely to have serious bugs. Um, yeah, and I write reasonably prevent uh, permanent remote compromise because, uh, of course, there are some. There are always some edge cases, like um, if the ARM ARM Cortex A7, which is uh, the CPU of the all winner SOC uh, on the line, is a uh, has some kind of remote backdoor. Then of there's nothing we can do about it, right? It runs our code, and if it doesn't want to run our code or alter it, then that's it. Um, yeah. So what does the design look like? Um, of course, there's the Olimax Lime 2, and there's a Trusted Boot Manager in the form of some simple microcontroller unit. So it's a Cortex M3 or M0, depending on how much we need. It will probably be an M0, uh, because those are uh, less powerful and cheaper. And there will be some SPI flash, which is uh, write protected. And um, well, the whole boot process is not very complicated, but I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a bit. And of course, there's the image verification part and the uh, image loading. And actually, I think the last part is probably the most <laughs> uh, uh, complex part, um, just because of uh, booting and loading operating systems not being a trivial, a trivial thing. OK. So the, the Lime 2 has many pins. It has several interfaces for SPI. Um, it has interfaces for NAND, as I said before. As I said before, so the, <laughs> the Lime 2 has several SPI pins. Um, and it specifically has uh, SPI 0 pins, which is where it starts wants to boot from. However, um, apparently there's two things called SPI0 on the all-winner. Uh, one is the main SPI0 interface that you can use to interface over SPI with you know, LED strips or whatever you want to use. But the bootloader, which is fused in the line too, it's a very small piece of code, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, doesn't look at those pins. It looks at different pins, which are also called SPI0. And those pins are not very accessible, and they're also multiplexed with NAND. That means if you want NAND on your Olimax line, you can't do SPI0. Uh, you can't do a SPI nor flash boot, which is a shame. Uh, but luckily, Olimax uh, ships devices without NAND. Um, UART, uh, UART is just a serial. Um, and the Lime has uh, three, three nice UART pins on the side that you can use for debugging. And the bootloader will print information to that. So that's probably not something you want to use when you're connecting uh, to the trusted boot manager. Um, but it has many more serial interfaces, so we can just use UR2, for example, to communicate with the Trusted Boot Manager. Um, unfortunately, right now, you cannot have any kind of NAND or eMMC or microSD card uh, connected. As I said before, NAND is right now completely impossible, also because it's multiplexed uh, um, with the SPI0 boot pins. But um, due to the way the bootloader on the Lime 2 works, uh, it will always try to load from an SD card first, then from NAND, then from uh, eMMC, and only then it will look at the SPI NOR pins. So if you have an SD card in there for storage, that means that if someone compromises the machine, they can just load a bootloader on the SD card, and then from now on, your code uh, will not be executed first. It will just execute code from the SD card when restarted. Uh, that's a, <laughs> a very huge downside. And I'm hoping that it's possible to uh, rewrite the all winner bootloader code, but uh, it is fused in the system on chip, so it might not be uh, possible. Or at least all winner can do it, but they probably won't. Um, apart from that, some other hardware modifications are currently required. I have a picture of that in a bit. Um, and of course, all the main storage will have to be on SATA, because that's what it can't boot from. And it's uh, as in the, the boot ROM on the line cannot load from SATA. But uh, once you load some code from your SPI flash, you can interface with SATA. So you can have a hard disk there and store everything there, which is, in my opinion, also the most reliable uh, data storage. OK, so I'm not sure if you've seen a line before. They're uh, like credit card sized. And this is uh, only two, maybe three centimeters. And this is where the NAND usually goes, um, or the eMMC. Uh, but of course, this one doesn't have either, because you can buy them from Olimax without uh, NAND and Lime. But they still have the pins here. And these three pins, which are barely discernible, I use a relatively good camera, but still isn't very visible. Um, these pins are, are used for SPI flash booting. It's the, um, the, the MISO, which is the master in slave out, the MOSI, the master out slave in. And I think uh, the clock for the SPI is also there. Um, that means that right now it's completely not viable to do it by yourself because I can do some basic soldering, but I couldn't do this. I needed a microscope and a very steady hand and a few very kind people at the Amsterdam Hackerspace <laughs> to help me do this. Um, and of course, it's also very fragile because the, the wires are actually very thin. They might look uh, relatively thick, but they're very thin. 
I have it somewhere in my bag, so I can show it to you at the end of the lecture if you're interested. Um, yeah, so what does this mean? This means that uh, we need OLIMX's help <laughs> to change this. Of course, the schematics are open, so we can uh, try to change them ourselves. But then the, the layouting of the PCB will need to be redone. And um, I'm hoping that we can convince OLIMX uh, to release yet another line board uh, with these pins more accessible. And there are some other pins that you need, but those are more easily accessible. So I'm hoping that uh, they will just make a whole set of nice SPI zero boot pins available. Um, yeah, so it doesn't look very pretty. It's just hot glue on there, but that's mostly because the, the wire is really thin. So if you pull it and I'm traveling around, then uh, you have to be really careful not to loosen it because then I have to somehow resolder it myself. OK, so I was talking before about the all winner to boot code, bootloader. Um, it's called the the BROM is what is what they call it in the all winner community or the Sonic side community. And the way it works, lots of uh, terms. The line two BROM loads the SPL, which is the simple program loader, and the simple program loader, um, which is loaded from SPI Flash, and that will load U boot, the universal bootloader. Uh, why? Because the line two has a uh, limit on how large the code is that it can initially start. So the simple program loader is part of U-Boot, but it's a small program that exists mainly to load U-Boot. So the line two loads the SPL, and then the SPL searches for U-Boot, and it loads U-Boot. And then you have a very nice uh, bootloader, also loaded from the SPI flash. Then U-Boot will load Linux. Uh, we considered uh, not loading Linux as well and doing everything from U-Boot, but then you have to implement your own uh, crypto, because oh, there might be some crypto parts for U-Boot, but if you just want to reuse something like, uh, well, not OpenSSL, but, but something like this that runs just fine on Linux, uh, in U-Boot it's a lot more work. You have to write a lot more of your own code. There's less libraries available. So we decided to load Linux from U-Boot. The only clear downside is that um, we want the kernel to be upgradable. And because this is all in the trusted stage, uh, the Linux kernel has to be relatively small, and it should fit on the SPI flash, because U-Boot will load it from the SPI flash. Um, and the Linux will, uh, kernel will contain Linux RamaFest, which contains some of the basic uh, tools to communicate with the trusted boot manager, uh, crypto libraries to verify images, uh, load code to search for SATA disks, mount them, and, and look, on, look for images on, the, on those uh, disks. Um, so really, everything that the line runs is, is on this small SPI NOR flash chip. And uh, I think if you want a 16 megabyte uh, SPR flash chip, it's uh, like one one dollar uh, on eBay or something. So that that's relatively cheap. And um, okay, so this Linux in the drama fest will communicate with the trusted boot manager. It will talk. It will set up the serial lines and talk over serial with the trusted boot manager and verify images. Um, I will talk more about how exactly that works later on. And then, the, in my opinion, more complicated part: the Linux in drama fest will load a new image using KXEC. So the trouble is we already have a Linux image, but we want a newer Linux kernel, which has newer features or, or, or bug fixes or security fixes, the most important ones. Um, but you don't usually load a kernel from your kernel, right? Uh, it's possible, but it's not uh, simple. And you have to think about uh, what is the state of my devices, my drivers, before I, before I restart. If my network interface is still doing something and I just randomly jump uh, in code to a new kernel, what happens with my network interface? Right, so uh, this is a difficult part. Um, and it's not something that, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of work on KXEG recently. So KXEG is a way to load uh, a newer Linux kernel, or older if you wish, from your current OS. And what it does, it basically shuts down almost entirely, turns off most of the CPUs except for one. Um, so hopefully the most of the, de <laughs> the device uh, drivers will be uh, un not, in not initialized anymore. And then it will start a new kernel, which will start from, from, well, from start. So it will start finding devices, initialize them and so on. OK, so this is basically what I already told you, uh, just in a picture, because sometimes pictures can help you understand it more. Again, uh, the BROM is just loaded from the line. It loads the simple program loader, which then loads U-Boot, uh, which then loads Linux kernel, and Linux kernel unpacks the in initial uh, RAM file system and uh, communicates with the Trusted Boot Manager. The Trusted Boot Manager is just some simple microcontroller unit, so it already has some code programmed in there. And uh, it will just start. There's no, no magic going on there. OK. So um, the TBM. 
as I said before, it will be some, some uh, ARM Cortex uh, CPU. It will probably be a STM32 CPU, mostly because there's a lot of support for those. And uh, it will just need serial and possibly also SPI in case we want to store uh, data on the Trusted Boot Manager, uh, which is something I'll cover on a bit later. And that really depends on your use case. So there are some really cool projects out there. Uh, so one of them is libopencm3, and it's, uh, I think it's been existing for quite some time. And what it does, it's uh, mostly headers, but also example files on how to run code on your uh, ARM Cortex-M0 or M3. And um, it's a LGPL license, so it's, it's, it's free software, which is really nice. Um, and uh, I, I played a bit with it, and they're very nice people, and of course I, uh, I, I tried to write some, to run some simple examples, and I, Im I immediately ran into some trouble because I compiled my own tool chain rather than use the provided one. And apparently, some floating point instructions that were emitted didn't work, and they were very uh, kind in helping me out to figure out the problem. Um, okay, so but but I was very new to all of this, right? So how how do you even work with a Cortex M0 or M3 uh, chip? Because uh, if you have an Arduino, you have you plug it in USB and you run your Arduino IDE or something, and it just programs it. Um, but for ARM, uh, Cortex and Braille chips, or M3, you need uh, JTAG debuggers. You can buy them on eBay for uh, 20 to $30. Uh, you can buy the original one for 600 euro or something, but they're the same, so why would you do that? And they are driven by OpenOCD, which is, again, an open source project. Uh, I'm really happy to see that there's so much uh, open source support because I was not looking forward to using proprietary IDEs that you have to buy just to do some simple things. So open OCD is, uh, I think it means open on chip debugger. So it's software to interface with the JTAG debugger, which is attached to the M0 uh, JTAG interface, which allows you to uh, flash code on there. Uh, but it also allows you to use uh, a debugger. So you can use the GNU debugger with those things. Uh, they just run on some port, and then with GDB, you can attach to them, and you can literally step through your code which is how I managed to figure out uh, why my toolchain didn't work, because it would just randomly jump to a high address where it, it hard-faulted, and even the hard-fault handler couldn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> so then I pasted some registers in the IRC channel of uh, libopencm3, and they could help me out. So they just gave me a binary in to verify that my hardware worked, and it worked. And then I used uh, some Ubuntu provided toolchain that did work. OK, so I'm currently testing uh, with the stm 32 f 0 discovery board. Um, which is a very nice board in the sense that uh, it already has one of those on-chip uh, uh, on chip debuggers on the board, so it's a relatively large board compared to how small the microchips usually are. But it comes with a USB port, kind of like the Arduino, with a, a more easy way to, to flash it, so you don't need to buy a separate debugger for it. Um, of course, I found this out long after <laughs> I already ordered lots of different components. Um, and it also features some, some buttons, so you can at least check uh, <laughs> if some buttons work, if your programs work at all. Um, but of course, this is way too large and very, very expensive, well, not like 30 euro, but uh, we, we don't want to use that for the actual uh, trusted boot manager. It's just a way to, to, to test. OK. Um, yeah, so the trusted stage. Um, the, the single purpose is to verify and, and load the Linux image, uh, and it will be signed. So how does that work? Well, I, I already covered some of these uh, things before. Um, Linux and the init RAMFS are loaded from Flash, and then the Lime has full access to the TPM. That means there's uh, probably a protocol um, that you can, that is, the, of course, known by the TBM and the Lime 2. So the, the Lime 2 can say, OK, uh, I have this image. Uh, what is the last version that I booted? So for example, you can. Uh, give each uh, new OS release that you uh, make a, a number that's one higher than the previous one. So you can say, OK, I, uh, I booted version 9, so I really don't want to boot version 1 to 7 because they're way too old, and I have other versions that work well. And this is also an attack factor. So for example, if you uh, can somehow force our code to run only very old images then which have a known networking exploit, then you can very easily take them over. So that's something you want to prevent. Um, OK, so you verify the image, and uh, you load it, and then you do k-exec, and then you change your root file system from your next image on MFS, and you move to the untrusted stage, which basically tells the trusted boot manager, don't accept anything apart from maybe the command that says, OK, I boot it successfully, because that's nice to know, because then you can say, oh, this image works. Um, cool. So uh, the purpose of this untrusted runtime is simply to uh, 
do everything else. It loads our, all our code. It might even uh, check signatures of more code, but uh, for the trusted boot manager, it doesn't matter. It still won't trust it. Uh, it will run web servers, whatever, whatever is required. So there's very limited access to the trusted boot manager. Uh, it can't really mess with the SPI flash, and uh, it will run lots of other code. And I already told you this. Um, OK, so trust management is a big thing. So how does that work? Um, in the most simple scenario, uh, you can have one or more keys in the read-only boot image. So uh, whatever I program on the SPI flash, I just add a few more keys on a certain address, and I load those. Uh, and uh, I load those public keys, and I just check if the image that I have um, is, is, is like, it, it matches. So this is simple, but it also means that you can't update the keys because the SPI flash is read-only. Um, so that's, that's a very simple scenario. And what you can also say, I want uh, valid signatures from at least n out of m keys. So if I have 10 public keys on there from 10 trusted parties, I want to trust at least uh, seven. I want at least seven of them to have signed the code, or I just want boot. Um, of course, we can also store keys on the trusted boot manager, which means that the Lime 2 will need to load keys from the trusted boot manager. Um, and uh, well, th this is possible, but it requires someone to load those keys on a trusted boot manager. And of course, as you can see, this is more, uh, you can do a lot more with this. Um, but for the very basic scenario, the, the top scenario is also uh, just fine. And of course, you can substitute uh, keys with root keys, where uh, everyone doesn't necessarily have their public root key on there, but uh, some keys that are signed by other keys. OK, so there are some more problems, which is uh, key revocation and key management. So uh, if, uh, if our key gets compromised, how do we tell everyone to not trust our key anymore? Uh, or how, how do I add a new key? Um, so that might, re might require human interaction. You can ask someone, OK, there's this very serious update. You have to press it bu this button. And that could either uh, tell the trusted boot manager to allow more than it would usually allow, um, or it provides some simple hardware interface for humans to revoke keys. Um, there's, no, there's no perfect system, right? If I, if I have my own home router, I don't need uh, root keys and then subkeys of those keys. Uh, by many parties because it's just I don't I don't need that and it's you don't want very complex code in there because it might require uh, it, it might have issues or uh, exploits. Okay, so um, I kind of already explained the slides. I'll just say it once more. Um, there are one or more keys in the in the SPI flash in the trusted root stage, and you can use those to uh, to verify everything, and you can require only a certain amount of signatures or all of them. Um, and as I said before, yeah, this is a, a very simple uh, uh, thing to do, but it's probably what we'll start with, right? Because that's that's the, the easiest thing to start with, and we're actually very close. Um, okay, so a more complex one is where the keys are stored on the trusted boot manager, and the Lime 2 attached flash is read-only, um, and then any kind of updates or images uh, might be able to revoke keys. So you can have some special file on your new up image that you're going to load that says, uh, don't trust these keys, <laughs> keys anymore, and, and do trust these keys. Um, it's possible, but then you might still want uh, very strict requirements on who signs those images that uh, uh, allow you to change keys. And it kind of locks the user out. So we might instead want to just uh, have users do this instead, if they are physically present. And of course, as you've probably noticed, uh, we don't uh, protect against physical compromise, because the user owns the device, so there's no such notion as physical compromise. It's only really for remote uh, remote uh, problems, which is the majority of uh, cases for us. Um, it is uh, possible to write protect only parts of the SPI flash, I think. Um, but that's actually useless. I thought it was actually really nice, and you can store the keys there. But then I figured that but then everyone who has root on the system can write to the SPI flash chip, which is not protected, and change the keys. So that's really something you don't want. So they, they, they can't, uh, you can't have anything that's read right on there. And trust it. Okay, um, the communication, exact communication between the Lime and the TBM, is not yet fully worked out because it really depends on the many use cases that we have. Uh, but in general, you can you can figure out that for the basic use case, it's really simple. Just what is the last version that of the OS that I booted? Okay, then I know what images I can't boot because uh, the number of the OS is within the part that's signed. So I just know that the number is actually that number. Um, yeah. And of course, I, I think personally it's useful to be able to load extra information from the Trusted Boot Manager. So uh, 
so that you can know what keys are, are, are in there because it's not, I don't think it's a attack surface that you can know what keys are trusted by the trusted boot manager. Okay, so some attack vectors. Um, I think these are all of them. One of them is that someone just manages to power cycle only the trusted boot manager. Uh, and then it will start thinking that the Lime is trusted again. So you really want to make sure that it's not possible to power cycle the trusted boot manager from the Lime too. And ideally, you probably want them on the same uh, power supply even. Um, there are some issues that I thought about before. Uh, there can be some exploits in the file system tools, the file system check tools. So if your hard disk is loaded and then <laughs> you want to check uh, uh, the file system and there might be an exploit in there that then immediately when you check the file system, someone takes over your uh, your uh, system, that's not very nice. Um, someone can prevent any kind of reboot or attempt to prevent any kind of reboot, so that means that uh, you have to physically go there and, and pull the power. Uh, on the other hand, maybe the trusted boot manager can, and can uh, cycle the power. Um, of course, there can be bugs in our trust management, but I hope to keep it very simple so that won't happen. Um, fine. And the TBM and the Lime 2 have no concept of the current date of time at all. There's no, there's some clock in the Lime that you can maybe trust, but if someone compromises the system, they can set the clock to whatever they want. So you, you don't don't use anything that's based on time, and that kind of rules out certificates. Right, certificates is valid from a certain time to another time, so we'll just not use that. Um, and what you can do is you can do a, a denial service attack, which is, I guess, an attack factor. So what you can use as do as, as a root, uh, if, if you compromise the device, is just remove all images on the device. So then when it starts, it can't find anything and it won't boot. Um, but that's still better than compromising your system. And I, I can't really think of a way to prevent this. I just can't think of anything. Uh, if you uh, have ideas, please let me know. <laughs> um, so these kind of things will result in, uh, in non-bootable systems. So, uh, the current status. Um, we can boot through the Lime 2 from SPI Flash. That's, uh, that works fine. We uh, worked with, the, or I worked with uh, some guys from the SunXI community, which are very helpful. Um, and they hadn't actually tested loading uh, from an SPI Flash or on the Allwinner A10 or A20, because all the hardware was uh, somewhat difficult to connect. But then we managed to do it. Um, and now the wiki page says that it, it's been tested, so it works. Um, the, the serial code on the TBM works fine uh, with libopencm3. I managed to, to load some code, and, I, and they can talk. So now I just need to uh, finish writing that protocol. Um, and I've managed to make KXI work. So I could load another, one kernel from another kernel. And uh, I made them very basic kernels, so there might still be things that will go wrong later on, but I really hope it won't. Um, yeah. There are quite some things left to be done. So I, I hope that we can, uh, can work with Olimax to uh, somehow make those pins uh, available, uh, because it's, it's not feasible to ask everyone to solder on, onto those small uh, uh, um, pins uh, where the NAND flash is located. Um, the SPI flash write protect uh, should work. I checked the data sheet, it worked fine. But of course, I was very naive, and I figured if I pull down the pin, I can't write anything to it. But that's not true. Um, it only protects the status register of the SPI uh, flash chip. So what you have to do is tell the flash chip, these regions are protected from writing. And then if you then lock the status register, it's not possible, I think, to change uh, the status of it being read, write, or read only. So uh, just, just not pulling that pin is not good enough. Right. Um, one other thing that needs to happen um, is there's no SPI driver yet for U-boot. So the Allwinner boot from has SPI support. It finds the flash chip, loads the code, and the SPL reuses that same code from the boot ROM or the, the same logic to load code uh, from SPI. But Uboot doesn't want to reuse it because the code on the Allwinner doesn't support more complex flash chips. And the idea is that you can also load Uboot from an SD card and then use Uboot to load from a more complex SPI flash chip. Uh, so that driver needs to be written, but there is a driver in Linux, so that should not be such a big deal. Um, then we need to figure out where to store information on the trusted boot manager. I think there's some uh, some regions that we can just use, like free program or, or data memory on there. Or we can even have uh, another SPI NUR flash chip connected to the TBM only, where you can store a lot of keys or whatever, whatever you want. Um, of course, more complex trust management is still something we need to do. And it says implement crypto, but I, I really think that crypto part is relatively trivial in the sense that I'm not going to implement my own, my own crypto. There's just systems that really work well, and I just will use something like this. Um, OK. So open questions right now are, apart from the things that need to be done, are, are user-facing workflows. How does it work? For, in, our, in our case, with the general practitioner, 
does he or she do anything with it? Is there a button that needs to be pressed to perform certain actions? Um, I'm hoping, but it's probably not possible, uh, that the, the, the boot ROM, which is fused in the Allwinner, can be changed so it first tries to load from the SPI flash instead of SD cards and everything else, because then you can actually use an SD card for storage. Um, and how does the TBM reset the line? Does it have a way to power cycle it or not? Um, and how does the reboot work? This is something I figured out relatively late. Like, if I want to reboot, then the TBM doesn't know I'm rebooting, and I can't just tell the TBM that I'm rebooting because it doesn't trust me anymore. Uh, <laughs> so the, this is probably similar to how does the TBM reset the line and, and then flash the power. Um, the precise boot image format is yet to be determined. Of course, the, the file system will be a SquashFS file system, which is just a file system compressed and then and, and, and loaded into RAM. Um, yeah, and there's a proposal for funding uh, with an LNET, which is a foundation in the Netherlands. Uh, so we're hoping to get some, some small amount of money to work on this. And of course, the license will be uh, open. Okay, uh, I went very fast, but uh, that's it. I have a few more notes if there are no questions, but uh, yeah. We have time for a few questions. So, you, you mentioned that the um, TBM doesn't understand when you're rebooting. How are you going to manage the situation where someone initiates a K exec from the running kernel? Uh, well, so the idea is that the trusted boot manager has a very simple state. It knows that, um, so, so how does it work? Um, the, the line two loads our trusted stage, then it loads some kernel from kexec, which is all trusted, and then it loads something untrusted. And it tells the trusted boot manager, do not accept anything from me anymore until you reboot. So it just says in memory, okay, I won't trust it anymore. So even then, if the line two boots a new kernel five times because it's remotely compromised, the, the TBM still will say, no, I won't, I won't accept what you're telling me on, on, on the serial communication. So that is a very simple, powerful concept, but it does give those weird issues with uh, re rebooting. <laughs> Okay. I believe this is the final question. Uh, have you looked into the security features of eMMC cards like RPMB? Sorry, once more? Have you looked into the special security features of eMMC cards? Yes, I have, in fact. Because there are some SD cards, for example, or eMMC cards, and you can tell them to not... Um, I wanted, wanted to add as well, so it's a good question. I started with uh, SD cards and see, like, can I force them into some kind of read-only mode? And yes, you can force them into some kind of read-only mode. The problem is that um, they are backed by, uh, by NAND, so there's some actual uh, ARM chip in those SD cards, and I think as well on eMMC, but you might correct me on that, which will implement the logic for not allowing you to write to it. However, um, these things are usually made in China in a very cheap manner, and they have to be programmed somehow. And um, I think, uh, I don't recall his exact name, but Bunny Studios, uh, someone who also made an open laptop, he had a large presentation or, or a blog post on how <laughs> he tore apart these things and showed that there's probably some vendor-specific commands that you can use to reset the thing and then allow read-write. So the idea was that um, the SPI NOR flash is much more simple, <laughs> um, so it's much harder to issue some kind of vendor-specific command to reset the whole thing. Um, yeah, and so uh, with actually with vendor-specific commands, I managed to force the SD card into read-only mode, and I could just mount it and not do anything with it, um, as not write to it. But uh, it seemed uh, not wise to trust it, because um, the, the chip in there is uh, programmed by, by Chinese, and they probably don't mind you reprogramming it, and I think Bunny managed to do that. Uh, yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, let's thank Merlin for his talk and for his answers.